my name is Krista Jones, founder and CEO of Virginia Leadership Institute, and welcome to A Seat at the Table. The purpose of this show is to bring together thought leaders and experts from a wide variety of fields to help us all get our seat at the table. Today, I am excited to have Congresswoman Donna Edwards with us to have a conversation about her political journey and any tips she can provide us about being stronger leaders and advocates. Welcome, Donna. Thank you. So Donna, tell me about your journey into politics. How did you get started? Well, you know, I started out running nonprofit organizations. In fact, one that I founded, the National Network to End Domestic Violence, and spent about 20 years in the nonprofit sector, and also a lot of time in my community organizing around zoning and planning issues and development. And that's actually what led me into the United States House of Representatives. So let's talk more about the issue of domestic violence, particularly because, you know, it's it's sad and amazing that it still plagues our communities. You know, and I know it's an issue in communities across the world. It has a lot of to do with outside factors. But can you talk about, you know, more specifically about some of the work that you did and why you think the problem still exists? Well, you know, I when I came into the work doing domestic violence, I started out as a volunteer in a local shelter. And what I quickly realized is that it was important for us to make changes in big systems and not just one individual at a time. Uh -huh. And so I ended up working with a lot of uh, organizations and women from around the country, um, first on the early years of what became the Violence Against Women Act of 19. 94. It actually took us about six years uh, under Joe Biden, then Senator Biden's yes. leadership, to pass the Violence Against Women Act, which was signed into law by President Bill Clinton. And what it did was provided resources to uh, shelters, services, and programs. It also provided training for law enforcement, judges, all of those who encounter victims and survivors of domestic violence. And it's made a tremendous difference in terms of the number of women who feel good about coming forward to report, but also in terms of the kind of services and support that they receive. But you know what? We're not anywhere near where we need to be to end violence against women. And why do you think it still exists. Why does this problem still exist in our communities? Well, it's a learned behavior. I mean, and my view is that if you can learn violence, then you can unlearn it. Yes. And that means that there are things that we can do in terms of educating and teaching people how to have healthy relationships, working with our young people so that they understand growing up that violence isn't an answer, whether it's in the home or on the street. And frankly, in my experience in the Congress, I spent a lot of time going in and out of prisons and jails, and I would always ask the prison population who has experienced domestic violence, and whether wow. it was a women's prison or a men's facility, all the hands would go up. Whether it was a juvenile facility, all the hands would go up because domestic violence actually is at the core of a lot of violence that we see. And I'm not saying that every instance of violence on the street can be prevented if we deal with domestic violence, but I'll tell you, um, if we can end violence in the home, I'm convinced that we can end it on the street. Amazing. You know, and another issue I know that you worked a lot with was after school care and snacks. And, and you know, really, when I heard that you were behind that issue in Maryland, I have used that example since in terms of the importance of getting diverse voices at the table because it takes someone to be able to personally experience an issue rather to, to really affect change. Can you talk about why that issue is so important and how it evolved? Sure, there was a time in my life, frankly, when I struggled as a young mom, uh, making sure that I had plenty of food on the table. And when I would visit uh, schools and um, local programs around uh, Prince George's County in Maryland, but across our state, and I would notice that you know some kids seemed like they were just very irritated, agitated, and frustrated. And I would talk to teachers about that, and they'd say, well, you know what? It's because that child is hungry. Wow. And I realized very quickly that in fact, there were so many children all across our state and frankly around the country who maybe they got breakfast in the morning because of our school nutrition programs and maybe they got lunch, but they didn't get dinner. And so I um, helped get Maryland added to what was called the after school suppers program to provide dinner uh, for children across our state. And that has had ripple effects actually all around the country. And I think it's really important. I mean, you and I both know that if we're hungry, 
salary, we can't get a thing done. Exactly. And so why is it that we would expect our young people to be able to learn and grow in the way that they need to if they're hungry too? And so it's a really simple premise to make sure that children are eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you know, really, when we talk about getting more engaged, being better advocates, it's interesting to hear your story because there are specific issues. I know there's a, a, a wealth of other issues, but specific issues that you're passionate about. And I think that it's important when we realize um, what journey we want to take to be advocates, it often just starts with an issue, being passionate about something. You said first it was zoning issues, and then you also you helped found the domestic violence prevention work, and then, you know, that's another issue that was important to you with after school suppers. So, but I wonder if you can talk more about some of the other skills and, and qualities that you feel that you've had to develop to become a strong advocate, to take you from the zoning issues all the way to the U.S. Congress. And so I'm a lawyer by training, mm -hmm. and I think that that's actually been very helpful to me in terms of my development, both in the nonprofit sector as an advocate, but also was very helpful to me in the United States House, um, where I could come in right away, study an issue, and then get right to working on that. Now, I'm not saying that all leaders need to be lawyers, um, but every once in a while, those legal skills really come into into play. They certainly did when I was working, for example, um, to uh, deal with the case of Citizens United, yes. uh, the campaign finance case that the Supreme Court decided. Well, it helped that I had worked on campaign finance reform issues. I understood the law, the statute, the Constitution, and could put that into application. But it's also been true on a range of other issues. I know in my community, when I was working on those zoning and planning issues, trust me, my legal skills really came forward and helped us actually to do better as community advocates in terms of reaching out to our elected officials and trying to make change at a local level. I have found those same skills to be very helpful in terms of the work that I've done nationally. So I, I've heard you say this before, but I really want you to tell the viewers today. You know, so you said at one time that people tried to get you to run for city council or school board. Why did you decide to run for Congress and not a, a local office first? Well, so I think it's really important to do your passion. And at the time, I didn't want to run for school board. I didn't want to run for the county council. I thought there were other people who were there and who were you know, doing a good job. And I wanted to run for Congress. And so I decided that I was going to run for Congress and no one was going to stop me. Now, I'll be truthful with you. My first run for the United States House, I actually lost that election. But losing really taught me a big lesson. And I'm not saying everybody should go out there and lose, but it really did teach me about some things that I needed to do in order to prepare myself the next go around. And sure enough, that next election, I won hands down. So ta let's talk more about that. So what are some of the things you learned um, in your first race that you applied to your, your subsequent races? Well, one of the things that I did differently in my uh, second run for the House is that I learned how to be at ease in terms of talking about myself personally. I think when you're a candidate for office, whether it's a local elected office or for the uh, Congress, and I ran for the Senate as well, I think people have to get to know you and con connect with you. And it was difficult for me because I'm a very, uh, you know, been a very guarded uh, person, and um, but I'm at ease with people, and I felt like it was important for me to share aspects of my story because they related to uh, the stories of thousands of constituents across my congressional district, um, and so that was a big lesson for me. I also had to learn how to smile a little bit more. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I think it's a real challenge as a woman, and particularly a woman of color, a black woman running for elective office. And, you know, still if you look at the at the Congress, I think 19% of the Congress are women. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that really pales into comparison uh, in terms of some of our competitive uh, nations. Um, but I think it's really important for women to develop and acquire the skills that it takes to run for elective office and then to make the decision to do that. And the more women that we have in the pipeline at every single level, the more women we will have an opportunity to move to much higher offices. So let's talk about some of those skills. I mean, something that I often hear when I talk to people about running for office is they're afraid to fundraise. Um, they don't want to ask for money. Can you talk more about how you've kind of gotten used to doing that? 
Well, until we have major campaign finance reform <laughs> and get all of that money out of politics, it turns out that you need money in order to run for office. And I would say it wasn't easy. It was always easy for me to ask for money for other people to do things, to exactly. ask for money for others to run for office, to ask for money for great cause. Um, but for the first time, I really had to ask for money for myself. And you know what? The only skill that I needed was to be able to pick up the telephone and call and ask. And it turns out that I had, a, as most people do, have a much wider network uh, than we think that we do. And so I drew from my personal network first, and then I drew from a larger national network. But there's no other choice. You just have to call and ask, or meet and ask, or knock on a door and ask. And after all, if you're able to ask for money, then surely you can go out there and ask people for your vote. Definitely, definitely. So I want to go back to some of your experience in nonprofit sector because, you know, a lot of the members of our sorority are both members of Zeta Phi Beta sorority and just people I meet all the time. We have trouble, um, you know, getting mobilizing people, getting them to, uh, you know, mobilize around a certain cause. You know, I call it, you know, influence. Um, a lot of us have trouble with that. Is there anything you've learned along the way just getting people to do what you want them to do around a certain cause? Well, I think part of it is convincing people that your cause is their cause. Yes. I mean, and that's called organizing. Um, the importance of elevating an issue that is of common concern and then drawing people to that, drawing people to what they naturally want to do, calling attention uh, to an issue. I mean, sometimes the reason that people don't mobilize and organize is because they're not even aware. And so part of the work that you have to do in order to organize around an issue is actually to bring it to people's attention, do some education around that, identify solutions. People want solutions yes. uh, to problems and concerns. They don't want you to just lay out the problem. They want you to have a solution. And mm. I think that when you marry those skills, then you're able to convince people, whether it's on an issue or convince them to vote for you for office. Definitely, definitely great advice. So can you talk just more about why it's important to have diversity around the table, whether it's women, whether it's African Americans? Can you talk more about diversity in, in elected office? Well, I think first of all, if you are not at the table, it means you're on the menu mm -hmm. and somebody else is deciding your fate. Mm -hmm. And so the importance of diversity is that it brings things to the table that might not be there otherwise, or from a perspective that I didn't live or you didn't live. And you know, m one of my great mentors was Shirley Chisholm. And I love the title of the show because she said, if there's not a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Exactly. And so I've taken many a folding chair uh, to the <laughs> meetings I've had to ten attend, metaphorically speaking. Um, but I, I think that those voices around the table make all the difference. And, you know, unfortunately, if you look at the Congress, for example, uh, to have only 19 percent uh, women in the, in the Congress is really woeful when we make up better than 50 percent exactly. of the electorate and so our voices need to be there we might decide things differently we might approach things uh, differently uh, we might unite people in a different kind of way and i think especially for women of color and especially uh, for black women look i'm a democrat and in the Democratic Party, the base of our party are black women. Mm. And yet our voices are not as represented, represented as they ought to be um, in the Democratic Party. And so I'm all about elevating the voices and experiences of women, of young women, of women who work, of women who are professionals, of women who um, make up the middle class, of poor women whose voices need to be around the table. And I, if I remember correctly, you were involved with the We Matter, Women Matter campaign, I think doing some work in your, in your last years in Congress. Can you talk more about that? I mean, what were some of the actual strategies um, that we did on the ground just to get women more engaged um, in the party and in our communities? You know, Krista, I'm glad that you mentioned that because um, I did, I led the effort, um, our When Women Succeed, America Succeeds yes. uh, agenda, and it really was about core issues of economic concerns 
of women, what it is that we are paying women and families for the cost of childcare, which now is rivaling the cost of college for families who Amazing. can ill afford it, uh, the, the gender pay gap, pay gap, the fact that, you know, women are paid, you know, just really three quarters, basically, um, of what a man is paid doing the same thing. And for black women, those numbers are even more extraordinary. They're about 64 cents on the dollar. For Latinas, it's about 54 cents on the dollar. And, you know, when we're doing the same work, we need to be paid the same. And that was one of those issues that we brought to the table. And of course, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit is really being led by women in this country. And so we need to make sure that our businesses are capitalized in the same kind of way because uh, we know that women employers, actually it turns out that they hire women, they hire working people, they hire in their communities. And so these were issues that you know, we tried to elevate and continue to elevate across the country um, concerns of women, but concerns of families. And the reality is that when a woman is paid uh, less than a man for doing the same kind of job, her family loses out. Um, if she's married, uh, her spouse loses out because she's not bringing in what she ought to um, in order to clear up that, that pay gap. So you brought up a, a, point, a good point a few um, minutes ago about the importance of you know, African-American women to the party. Um, can you talk more about, for some of those people, you know, I've had guests on the show who um, frankly felt that African-Americans were being taken advantage of by the party, didn't feel welcome in either party. Can you talk more about how we as African-Americans can really show um, the Democratic Party leadership our importance and why we need to be taken seriously and they need to listen to our voices? Well, so if you look back on the 2016 election, 94% of African-American women voted for Hillary Clinton. Um, she won less than a majority of white women voters. So mm -hmm. I think there's still a lot of work uh, to be done, but what that demonstrates is that um, black women do really make up the base of the Democratic Party, and it's time for our voices and concerns to be elevated and for more black women to be in positions of leadership, both in our party at every single state level, um, but also um, in, in our governor's mansions and the House of Representatives in the United States Senate. And one of the reasons that I ran for the United States Senate is because I do believe in this idea of diversity and bringing to voice uh, diverse uh, voices to the table. And the fact is, if you look at the Senate today, Kamala Harris from California is the only um, black woman who's in the Senate. And before that, it was Carol Mosley Braun, and yeah, that ago. was a really <laughs> long time ago. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, some people say, oh, we got Kamala, so therefore the job is done. Well, I don't think so. We need more than one seat at the table. Definitely, definitely. Um, so can you, t what advice would you have to someone who was interested in running for office? What's the, well, what's the, what advice would you give? So I'll share this with you. When I decided to run for the House, I actually went around to a whole bunch of other people to try to get them to run first. And it wasn't <laughs> until the last minute when I couldn't find anybody that I decided to run. What I would say to women is don't wait until you're asked seven times. Men don't do that. Look in the mirror and see a member of the Board of Education or the County Council or as County Executive or Governor or House or Senate and just do it. I mean, there's no harm in trying. And, you know, you're only going to win if you get in the game. You're not going to win by sitting on the sidelines. And we need every single voice at the table. So I think some people would say, you know, I always hear people who are hesitant to run, they don't like the, um, polarized politics, the partisan politics, they don't like people being mean to each other. And you know, you you know went through a lot of challenges with your Senate race as well. So can you talk about what you say to people who respond, to, how do you respond to people that say that? Well, first of all, I think look at our democracy, okay? Our democracy was built on this idea that we do a push and pull. And we've yes. had peaks and valleys. And I mean, I say to people all the time, at least in the House, um, we're not calling people out for duels right. uh, the way <laughs> that evolved. happened in the 1700s <laughs> right. and the, 18, in the, the 1800s. Right. And so I think we have evolved. Um, and it's about a competition of ideas and ro a robust competition 
of ideas. And so that part of it really never has bothered me. And I always was able to find ways, sometimes not in the front of the cameras, but behind the scenes to work with my Republican colleagues to the extent that that was possible, but really to compete uh, for the best ideas to make a difference in communities. And I would say, don't let that hold you back um, mm -hmm. from from running because we need to hear your ideas. Those ideas need to be in front in front of us and there's no reason uh, that we can't have a robust competition there. And so what about your Senate race? What what do you think you learned from your Senate race? Well it was brutal. <laughs> um, I say that all the time. And I mean it was and it, it was disappointing. Obviously it's always disappointing to um, to lose. Uh, I was surprised frankly by the mean-spiritedness of the attack within the Democratic Party. And I think that we have some challenges in front of us, and I think it's important for us to face those head on and to identify them. Um, I do still think that even within the Democratic Party, certainly within the uh, country, we learned this through Hillary Clinton's um, race in 2016 for the, for the presidency, that we haven't conquered racism and mm -hmm. sexism. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't conquered those things at all, and it's really important for us to put that out on the table and to look at ways that we can take on those challenges. And that's why I want more women in the pipeline at every single level. And from my personal perspective, I may have been beaten up in that Senate race a little bit, but you know what? I'm not done. Right. And I think people are watching are going to say, okay, so what's next for Donna? I mean, you, we've seen you on national television. We know you are an activist and a leader in your community. Where do you see yourself, you know, 20 years down the road? Well, 20 years <laughs> down the road, <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure I'm looking right okay, there. Okay, okay. Um, but I will, I will say this. I mean, I think that there's still a lot to accomplish um, in the political sphere mm -hmm. um, in terms of policy that would make a difference for people in my community and across the country. And I'm looking forward to trying to take on some of those challenges. And I haven't totally decided where I'm going to land mm -hmm. yet, but I know that it's going to be some place where I feel like I can make a difference. Uh, the things that I'm motivated by, I'm motivated uh, by making sure that our young people get the best education that they can so that they can take on the challenges of the 21st century. I'm motivated uh, by making sure that we can have more women in elective office. I'm motivated um, by trying to create the kinds of economic opportunities that don't just go to the top, but, but go all the way down the income yeah. ladder. And so those things uh, really get my juices going, and I'm going to find some place that I land where I can focus on those issues to make a difference uh, for, uh, for people. Because after all, what else is there to do? Right. So you mentioned youth, and you know, we talk a lot about how millennials think, act, we've dissected them completely. What, and a lot of times I hear that they're not as engaged as we want them to be. Do you have any advice for our communities in terms of trying to get millennials, Generation Z, et cetera, engaged in politics and civic life, period? Well, as the mother of a millennial, okay. <laughs> I've had some insight into that. Okay, that's great. Uh, one is how, how, how we reach them. I mean, um, my son, for example, I don't even know the last time that he picked up a newspaper, but he certainly pays attention to the news. He just gets it on his device. Right. And so we have to figure out ways in which we can engage them. We've seen through some of these movements going on across the country, you know, whether it's Black Lives Matter or, some, or the uh, movement for climate change, young people are very engaged in those things. Those are, are issues that drive them, that make people, uh, make them passionate. And I think it's up to us to encourage that. I want to see more millennials running for office. I've had the privilege of supporting a couple of millennials out in Prince George's County to run uh, for the school board, and they've won. And so I think that they have a lot to offer, a lot to learn, and we have a lot to learn from them. And you bring up a great point, because I feel like when Black Lives Matter first got started, they got some pushback from some of the older black established politicians with the methods, with the way they have decided to try to make change in our communities. Do you have any thoughts about that? Just about, you know, a lot of people talk about your elder, you know, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, and how their methods may not be um, right for every issue. Can you talk about the difference in those movements and where you maybe see the black community moving forward on that, on the Black Lives Matter issue? 
Well, you know, when some of the leaders that you identified were young people, and they were young, <laughs> um, including Martin Luther King Jr., who yes. was young at the time as well, they were criticized mm -hmm. uh, for their strategies and tactics. And mm -hmm. so um, this generation has a different set of strategies and tactics. I actually so admire them because uh, they are working so passionately on issues of concerns to their peers uh, around the country. And it's a new movement with new energy. Yes. And I want to figure out a way to embrace it. I think the same thing about the Women's March mm -hmm. um, that you know organically you know, drew millions uh, around the country and certainly others around the globe um, to the causes and concerns of that women would bring to the table these are all young people doing doing this and so I don't I think that we should be embracing that and encouraging that and then helping them to learn some lessons that maybe they haven't learned quite yet but certainly not casting it aside because I, I think that you know every generation has to figure out the strategies and the tactics that work uh, for this generation. And in the 21st century, that doesn't necessarily look like the same tactics that worked in the 20th century. Very well said. said. Thank you so much, Donna. It has been my pleasure to have this conversation with Congresswoman Donna Edwards today. You know, she started off as an activist. She said she was concerned with issues, you know, zoning issues in her local community. She went on to found um, a major domestic violence organization, was involved with legislation around that. And I think that rise into Congress and just into being in elected office is really a path that a lot of women, a lot of African Americans should consider taking. If there's an issue that you're passionate about, if there's something something you want to share with the world, if you want to share your voice, follow that path into elected office or civic leadership. And that's really what this show is all about. We bring in guests every month to talk about how we can get that seat at the table. And like Donna said, and like Shirley Chisholm, her mentor said, if there is no seat for you, bring a folding chair. If you are not at the table, you are on the menu. So thank you so much for listening to this episode of A Seat at the Table.